On July 2, 1981, Simon Partington left his house in Surrey, British Columbia on his bicycle but never returned home. He was nine years old and lived with his parents who had emigrated to Canada from England. His father was an electrician and his mother worked as a hairdresser. There had been a number of other children reported missing from the area over the previous few months, but most of them were shrugged off as runaways. Kids from broken homes who were seen as just moody juveniles, but Simon was different. He was from a good Catholic home and he seemed like a well-adjusted kid. Authorities had no reason to think he would run away. When police began searching, they soon found his bicycle abandoned around the corner from his house. This made them positive that Simon had been abducted and it was the first time that anyone started to connect the multiple disappearances in the area to each other. Some authorities were certain that there was a child predator on the loose in Vancouver. This is Monsters. Clifford Olson Jr. was born on January 1, 1940 in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. His birthday was mentioned in the local paper as one of the half-dozen babies born in the city on that day. He would spend his life telling people that he was the first baby born in Vancouver in 1940, which would have made him the recipient of a number of gifts given out to the baby with that title. Records show that he wasn't the first baby, but he may have used it to display some sort of status to others. He had a stomach blockage at birth which required surgery and left him with a scar on his stomach. It's also rumored that when he was older, he might have led people to believe that he had been stabbed. Clifford was born to an unwed mother named Leona who had divorced another man before meeting a soldier in the Canadian Army named Clifford Olson. This left Leona alone and unwed at the time of Clifford Jr.'s birth which was highly stigmatized at the time. She moved briefly to a small town on Vancouver Island where it was cheaper to live. Then, in 1943, she and Clifford Jr. moved to Edmonton to live with her parents. Clifford Sr. returned from the war in 1943 and he and Leona were married on March 17th. They would go on to have a daughter and two more sons together. Clifford would later confess that one of his earliest memories was of playing a quote-unquote game with his teenaged uncle when he was four years old. The uncle told him and a female cousin who was also around four years old that they had to strip naked and let him lay on top of them. That was the game. Afterward, he would give them a nickel and tell them not to tell anybody. Clifford would claim that the assault from his uncle didn't affect him because there was no penetration. You grew up to become a pedophile child killer, Clifford. It's very unlikely that that's a coincidence. The environment that Clifford grew up in left him with very little in the way of rules or much attention from adults. He quickly learned that lying was a good way to get what he wanted or to get out of trouble. He would blame his misdeeds on other children in the family. He had a natural ability to manipulate adults and always seemed to get away with it. His mother was the easiest to con. She didn't have a strong will to deny the boy and easily gave in to whatever he wanted. This, along with his father not really having an interest in him, caused Clifford to become somewhat of a mama's boy. Clifford Sr. didn't really like children and tended to just ignore his junior. When Clifford was five, his family moved back to Vancouver where his father used his veterans' benefits to purchase a house. When Clifford entered school, his lack of discipline growing up became an immediate problem. His teachers would say that Clifford was very friendly and polite, but he simply just did whatever he wanted. Having rules was something that he just didn't understand. He stole constantly, and at the age of five, he was regarded by neighbors as a habitual criminal. When Clifford was six years old, he stole $200, which would be around three grand today, from his uncle's wallet and took a bunch of kids from the school out for ice cream. Then he brought them with him as he went to the barber shop and got a haircut. When he paid the barber for the 50 cent haircut with a $10 bill, the barber saw the wad of cash the boy had and called the police. When the officer took him home, Leona was the only adult there and she did absolutely nothing to punish her son. 
she actually told him that the worst offense he committed was getting caught. She did tell him not to steal from family members. She also gave him the advice not to flash so much money, but above everything else, don't get caught. That was what Clifford learned when he got caught stealing at six years old. With this reinforcement that theft would go unpunished, Clifford began stealing more and more. He would regularly offer to help a blind street vendor with the true intention of ripping him off. He would steal from a local store and use the goods to buy friendships. He would frequent a five and dime where he would switch price stickers to buy expensive items at a cheaper price. When Clifford was 10, he started having an attraction to girls. Instead of chasing them and playing innocent games like other kids might do when they're curious about their hormones, Clifford was more forceful with his desires. He had only ever learned that he could just take whatever he wanted when he wanted it and he wouldn't suffer any consequences. When he became interested in the female anatomy, he began forcing girls to show him their private parts at knife point. He had also started playing the quote-unquote game with his younger sister and her friends. More proof that his uncle abusing him did in fact affect him. As Clifford got older, he developed more and more ways to steal. His father was a milkman in the area, and he would occasionally go with him on deliveries. People would put money in their empty milk bottles to pay for another delivery when the milkman came by. Clifford Sr. had one bottle in his cart that he dumped all of the change into as he collected it. Clifford Jr. started out stealing some of the change from that bottle. Then he started getting up early and stealing the money directly from people's front porches. Then he started following other milkmen around, waiting for them to leave their cart and stealing their bottle full of change. The milk was delivered into a milk box that passed through into the home. It wasn't long before Clifford realized that he had a friend who was small enough to fit into the house through the milk box and they began going into people's homes and stealing money. He would also go to the local racetrack and wait for gamblers to line up to cash out their winnings. He would run up and snatch a ticket out of someone's hand and dart off. He would later say that once he got a ticket worth $114. Clifford was a bully from a very young age. He always wanted to be superior to everyone else, but the problem was that he was small, so he would often end up getting beat up. In 1954, Clifford joined the Bridgeport Boxing Club under the guise that he wanted to be able to defend himself. In reality, he wanted to be able to beat up other kids with less chance of losing the fight. His coach would say that he turned out to be a pretty good boxer. He was a runner-up at a bronze glove tournament, but later in life Clifford said that he was the winner of a golden glove tournament. Clifford eventually started working at the same racetrack where he once stole tickets from unsuspecting gamblers. He walked and groomed the horses and was responsible for security at the stables. One evening, a group of kids snuck into the stables and Clifford chased them out. All of the youngsters fled, with the exception of one girl. She ended up spending the night with Clifford and the two began dating. Clifford's friends said that the first time he had sex, he became obsessed with it. I mean, it's not unusual for a teenage boy to be interested in sex, but they said that it was all he was interested in. When his girlfriend mentioned the idea of marriage, Clifford broke up with her. Clifford repeated the seventh grade and still didn't pass on the second try, so he dropped out of school in 1956. He worked full-time at the racetrack until he was caught trying to cash a forged check for $400. He had forged his boss's name on the check, and when he was caught, the police weren't involved, but he was fired. Clifford continued to support himself with theft. He was finally arrested in 1957 after breaking into a furniture factory. As he was prying the side door open, an off-duty officer saw him and called the police from a nearby service station. He was caught and charged with 17 crimes, but was only convicted of one, earning him nine months in the New Haven Borstal Institute. This was a reform facility for youth offenders and wasn't really a high-security place. So after serving four months, Clifford and two other boys escaped and stole a boat. They tied it off to a log boom in the middle of the Fraser River where they slept for the night. The next morning they ditched the boat on the shore and each went their separate ways. Clifford went home, but there his father convinced him to turn himself in, which he did. After being rearrested, he pleaded guilty to 17 extra charges and was sentenced to two years in Ogala prison. 
Clifford appealed the sentence and got it reduced to one year. It was this prison stint where Clifford had his first homosexual experience. When he witnessed two other inmates raping a third, a young man named Lauren Johnson, Clifford had no problem jumping in and taking part in the rape. After that, he and the victim had a long-term relationship and even performed a makeshift marriage ceremony in prison. Clifford was granted parole in April of 1959, but was arrested two months later. He was sentenced to another two years in the same prison. After he was released in 1961, he went back to live with his parents. One night, he broke into the Canadian Legion and stole a bunch of watches. When Clifford Sr. became suspicious, he searched his son's room and found the watches. Clifford Sr., being a frequent patron of the Canadian Legion, did not return the stolen goods to their rightful owners. He sold the watches and kept the money for himself. This is the example that Clifford grew up with. Not only did his mother refuse to punish him for any wrongdoing, but his father was also a crook. In 1961, Clifford Sr. was sentenced to six months in prison for running a bingo scam. He called the bingo numbers at the Canadian Legion each week and he began memorizing one bingo card which he would then make sure got sold to a family member. They would win either a $5,000 or a $10,000 prize. The family member would keep 10% and Clifford Sr. and his partner would split the rest. Eventually, one of the family members kept all of the money and when Clifford Sr. banned them from ever playing bingo again, the family member reported the scam to the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. They got the family member to talk to Clifford Sr. and his partner about the scam and listened in. After hearing them confess the details of the scam, they were arrested and sent to prison. While this was happening, 21-year-old Clifford Jr. was wooing a 17-year-old girl named Janet. Janet was from a strict religious family and had seen Clifford around. His prison record gave him credibility with the younger kids and when it came to sex, that's how Clifford liked them. The younger, the better. One day, Janet was waiting in the rain for the bus when Clifford pulled up and offered her a ride. She reluctantly got in his car and by the time they were close to her house, he had talked her into the back seat. After losing her virginity to Clifford, she dated him secretly for a few months before he suddenly disappeared. She was depressed about what seemed like an obvious rejection, but was horrified when she found out she was pregnant. After telling her parents, they arranged for her to give birth at a Roman Catholic hospital where the hospital claimed the baby died. Janet believed that the baby was taken away and put up for adoption. Little did Janet know at the time that Clifford's disappearance was caused by another arrest. He was sent to prison, had escaped, and had been caught committing more crimes before being sent back to prison. By the time Clifford was finally out, Janet had met and married another man. During the 60s, Clifford was in and out of prison often for nonviolent crimes. He was a habitual thief and fraudster. In the summer of 1964, Clifford drove to Southern California, picking up young girls along the way. When his car broke down, he sold it and rented a convertible, but soon crashed it. He ran from the scene and took a bus to San Francisco, where he picked up another young girl and brought her back to Vancouver with him. Back in Vancouver, Clifford continued his regular routine of robbing any place where there were valuables. After a few months, he was caught and sent back to prison with a sentence of three years and five months. After eight months in the clink, Clifford got bored and decided it was time to get out of there. He told the doctor that he was having trouble urinating, and when he was asked to pee into a cup, he pricked his finger and dropped some blood in with the urine. The doctor ordered him to the local hospital, and while in the waiting room, his guard left him alone without handcuffs to go look for the doctor. Yet, Clifford took off the minute the guard was out of sight. He ran to a neighborhood where he stole a bicycle and took back roads out of the area. He checked into a cheap motel and then stayed with a friend while he was laying low. Clifford stole any way he possibly could. Once he walked up to an elderly lady on the street and asked if she could use her phone. Inside her house, he dialed a fake number and pretended to tell someone that he needed a ride quickly because his child was sick. This helped lower the woman's defenses, and when he asked for a glass of water, she left him alone to go to the kitchen and get him one. While she was gone, he dug through her purse and stole 
Another time, he took a tour through a model apartment under the guise that he was looking for a rental. While inside, he quietly unlocked the back door and came back that night to steal everything he could. He found a 22 caliber pistol during one burglary, and despite it not having any ammunition, he used it to rob a Safeway grocery store. The manager handed him a money bag and Clifford ran off, not realizing that he had only gotten a bag that contained $89 worth of rolled coins. There was another bag with $15,000 in bills, but he didn't wait long enough for the store manager to give it to him. Eventually, the police became suspicious of Clifford and his friend and began surrounding the house. Clifford noticed movement out of a window, and the pair were able to sneak out to the car and escape. They headed south and crossed into the U.S. through an empty field, but a resident saw them and reported them to the Border Patrol. Soon, they were pulled over in Blaine, just south of the Canadian border, and Clifford darted from the car. After an extensive search in the nearby woods, they weren't able to find the fugitive, so they brought in search dogs who quickly sniffed him out. Clifford was soon back in prison. Clifford spent a long stretch of time in prison. He escaped a couple of times, but was quickly caught and had time added to his sentence. In prison, he kept his insatiable appetite for sex at bay by using other inmates to fulfill his desires. Clifford would later say that he never considered himself homosexual or even bisexual as he preferred women, but he needed sex and he would get it however he could. In prison, he didn't care if the sex was consensual or rape. He took what he wanted. Clifford was released on parole in August of 1972. Some people were surprised that he was granted parole, but the court saw Clifford as more of a nuisance than anything else. The crimes he had been locked up for didn't prove him to be as much of a danger to other people as he would turn out to be. It wasn't long before Clifford began skipping appointments with his parole officer and was questioned by police for writing bad checks. He only had six weeks of freedom before he was rearrested and his parole was revoked. Six months later, he was released again and he began traveling around the country with a 14-year-old boy named Glenn. On their travels, they met a woman named Evelyn Gagnon and the three went to Edmonton, Calgary, Vancouver, Toronto, Victoria, Winnipeg, and Manitoba, amongst other places. The whole time, they stayed in hotels together and Clifford had sex with both Glenn and Evelyn. Evelyn knew about Clifford's sexual relationship with a 14-year-old and also noticed that he left once a day and returned with cash, but didn't ask questions. It wasn't until after they visited Evelyn's grandmother that she began to suspect that Clifford was not as innocent as he made himself out to be. Not long after they left, her grandmother reported that $2,700 was missing from her house. Clifford had just happened to come into about that much money at the same time. While they were on a bus to Prince George, she asked him outright if he had ripped off her grandmother, but he assured her that he didn't. At the next stop, Clifford got off the bus claiming he wanted to stretch his legs, and Evelyn never saw him again. After Clifford made his way back to Vancouver and settled into a steady pattern of stealing from apartment buildings that catered to the elderly, he was caught again and sentenced to four years and five months for a number of charges related to theft and forgery. While he was in prison, two different women wrote to the parole board urging them to release Clifford. One of them claimed to be pregnant with his baby and wanted him to be released so they could get married, and the other claimed that she had had Clifford's child six months prior and wanted him to be released so they could get married. They both wrote that they believed that parenthood would force Clifford to go straight. The parole board ignored both letters. Clifford had been transferred to the Prince Albert Penitentiary, and while there, word got out that he had given information about drugs to prison officials. When inmates learned that he was a rat, they lured him into a poker game and then attacked him. Clifford fought back and managed to make it out alive, but he was stabbed multiple times. In the hospital, when the warden asked if he could identify his attackers, he said, quote, Fuck yeah, I can identify them. The warden was surprised because it was rare for an inmate to rat out their attackers, but Clifford didn't care. He identified them and testified against them in court. From then on, Clifford was housed in protective custody. Clifford was eventually transferred back to British Columbia where he met another inmate who was in protective custody named Gary Marcoux. 
In the summer of 1976, nine-year-old Jeannie Duve was raped and killed in the Weaver Lake camping area. Jeannie lived next door to a halfway house where Gary was getting ready to be released back into society after serving five years for raping his own sister, who was 18 years old at the time. He was also suspected of molesting his other sister, who was only two years old at the time. Despite finding no evidence that Gary had committed the rape and murder, they arrested him and charged him with the crime. Because it was a child killing, he was also housed in protective custody. He and Clifford were the only two inmates in protective custody, and while they were in the yard, Clifford asked about the case and Gary claimed that the police had nothing on him, and if he had a solid alibi, he would get off with no problem. Clifford offered to help. He said he was out of prison at the time and he could claim they were together, because that wouldn't seem suspicious at all. Well, Gary was desperate and he took Clifford up on his offer. Clifford asked him to write down all of the details so he could answer questions without contradicting something Gary said. Over the next 10 days, Gary wrote down details and drew maps and gave them to Clifford. He confessed to every detail about the kidnap, rape, and murder of Jeannie. Clifford put everything in an envelope and sent it to authorities. He explained that Gary wanted him to give a false confession, but was actually in prison at the time of the murder. At Gary's trial, Clifford ended up testifying against him and the child rapist and murderer was sentenced to 25 years in prison with no parole. Clifford wasn't offered any favors for his information about Gary. He wasn't even asked to do it. Clifford came up with the plan and turned over all the information on his own. When he was asked why he did it, he answered, quote, I was simply being a good citizen. After all, you can't have someone like that running loose on the streets. The irony of that statement would soon grow to epic proportions. Clifford was released on parole on February 11, 1977, but only made it to April before it was revoked. While back inside, he began taking religious courses, claiming he had turned to Christianity to help him end his criminal lifestyle. He was released again in January of 1978 and was given a job and a place to stay by a Christian family who volunteered to help reformed convicts. They were under the impression that Clifford had become a Christian and was using religion to turn his life around, but they quickly realized it was all bullshit. It only took a few weeks before he was missing appointments with his parole officer. He tried to molest a disabled 12-year-old at a motel and the girl's brother ended up throwing him through a window. He had to go to the hospital and get stitches. Clifford eventually learned that the heat was on him again and he fled to Newfoundland where he met a young woman named Patricia who had a 7-year-old daughter. He spent a few weeks with the woman having sex with her but also trying to seduce the daughter. He convinced them to pose together in quote-unquote artistic nude photographs. After building up enough trust with Patricia, she let him take her daughter and a friend to a nearby circus. After buying them all the food and souvenirs they wanted, he brought them back to his hotel where he took nude pictures of them and molested them. They both began to cry, so Clifford took them home. Patricia asked her daughter what was wrong, but the girl was evasive. When Clifford showed up the next day, offering to take the daughter on an airplane ride, Patricia said no and told him that she knew what he was doing. Clifford acted insulted by the idea and stormed off. She never saw him again. Clifford traveled to the U.S. where he scammed money in various states. He scammed about $5,000 from an elderly pensioner in New York. He scammed $600 out of a young woman in Texas. He scammed retirees in Florida out of thousands. From Miami, Clifford flew to Seattle and took a bus back into Canada. He made it into Alberta before being arrested again in September of 1978. He was sentenced to two years and nine months. In January of 1980, Clifford was back out of prison and took no time getting back into stealing and scamming. He was now conducting a scam where he would go into a hardware store, purchase an expensive tool, pay in cash, then go outside and put the tool in his car. Then he'd go back into the store, pick up the exact same tool and return it with the receipt from his purchase. He would get his cash back and then he would go sell the tool he had stolen. Or he would buy a VCR from an electronic shop, put it in his car and go back in and return an identical VCR off the shelf. 
He could go a year without ever hitting the same store twice, and most stores didn't even realize they had been robbed. In February, Clifford met two women in a hotel bar, and when one of them left to go home to her kids, Clifford managed to get the other woman, who was so drunk she was basically unconscious, up to his hotel room. The next morning, Joan Berryman woke up horrified that she went to bed with a man she had just met. She didn't even remember his name. Despite her embarrassment, she agreed to see Clifford again, and soon, he moved into her house. Clifford would later claim that he didn't love Joan at first, he was just using her for money. She was newly divorced, and he was milking her for her divorce settlement. Eventually, though, he said that he fell in love with her, and when she told him she was pregnant, he was thrilled. On November 17, 1980, 12-year-old Christine Weller went to a friend's house after school mainly in an effort to stay away from her own house. Her parents were usually fighting, and her father could be abusive. As it got closer to dinner time, she borrowed her friend's bike and headed home. Christine loved riding bikes, but her family didn't have the money to buy her her own. When her father got angry at dinner and stood up, exclaiming that he was going to walk to the bar, Christine offered to keep him company. She wanted another opportunity to ride the bike she had borrowed. When they got to the bar, her father said goodbye and told her to ride straight home. Unfortunately for Christine, her path took her right past the apartment that Clifford and Joan had just leased. Joan was now four months pregnant and been beat up by Clifford one too many times. When Clifford got home from work, which was him buying and returning goods from various stores, he found a note that said she had left him. He got into his car and went out to find her, but as he was leaving the apartment, he spotted Christine riding by on her friend's bike. He called her over to his car and asked if she knew any young girls who wanted to help him wash windows for $10 an hour. The U.S. minimum wage in 1980 was $3.10 an hour, so $10 an hour might as well be a million dollars to a 12-year-old. He explained that he built houses and needed people to wash windows and shampoo carpets before the new owners moved in. Why you would need to shampoo carpets in a new home is beyond me, but that was the story he used to lure young girls to his car. He told her he was going out to one of the houses to meet with an employee and offered for her to come along. On the way, he fed her beer and talked to her about her family, peppering in compliments to make her more comfortable with him. They went to a house that was under construction, and he later claimed that he kissed her and essentially dry-humped her to climax. Then they drove back to his apartment because he wanted to see if Joan had returned. When he found the apartment empty, he grabbed a bottle of sleeping pills and returned to the car. He gave Christine some vodka and orange juice, then he gave her some sleeping pills and told her they were special pills that would counteract the alcohol and make it so she wasn't drunk by the time they got to her house. Clifford drove out of the area and found a secluded spot. It was likely a spot he had taken other young boys and girls before, but Christine was his first confirmed victim. She was barely conscious, and Clifford raped her multiple times vaginally and anally. When he was ready to leave, his car was stuck in the mud, and despite spending an hour trying to get it out, he wasn't able to. He would need to get a tow truck, but he couldn't do it with an unconscious 12-year-old rape victim in his back seat. Clifford used her shoelaces to try to strangle her, but they broke and she was still breathing. He pulled her out of the car and raped her again before dragging her into some bushes and stabbing her multiple times in the chest. Then he slit her throat. He went through her clothes and removed her school ID. He tossed the clothes into a river and wiped down his car to get rid of her fingerprints. Then he walked to a nearby hotel and called for a tow truck. When they got to his car, as the tow truck driver was hooking up a cable from his winch, the driver had no idea that in the bushes, about 50 feet away, was the dead body of Christine Weller. It was a week before anyone sounded an alarm that Christine was missing. Her friend had gone to her house to retrieve his bike, but her grandmother said she hadn't been around for a few days. A few days, a week, who can keep track? She said that Christine had a habit of running away and she'd probably be back eventually. The friend's dad reported the bike stolen, but when he told the RCMP that the girl was missing, they told him that a missing persons report had to come from the family. He tried to notify the Welfare Crisis Center about the missing girl, but they said they knew she had a history of running away and weren't willing to do anything. 
He tried to follow up on some of the leads himself, but after another week with no sign of Christine, she became another name on a list of missing children that nobody really seemed to care about. Joan would eventually go back to Clifford, and he took her on a 10-day trip to Hawaii. While there, he threatened a bar owner with his knife and ended up getting arrested. The charges against him were dropped, but the police never gave him back his knife. Christine's murder weapon would remain in Hawaii while Clifford and Joan returned to Vancouver. On Christmas Day, 1980, a man was out taking a walk in the unseasonably warm weather. As he strolled along the Fraser River, he saw what he thought was a mannequin in some bushes. Now, we can all say it at the same time, it's never a mannequin. As he took a closer look, he realized that it was a human body and he left to notify the police. When he got to the road, he saw an RCMP cruiser and flagged it down. Underneath the bushes, they found the partially decomposed body of a nude young girl. The autopsy revealed ten stab wounds, two of which had entered her heart. There was alcohol in her system and evidence of vaginal and anal rape. They found traces of semen inside of her. Her identity was confirmed through dental records to be Christine Weller. She had been reported missing nine days after she got into Clifford's car. Police questioned a number of suspects, mostly Christine's friends and family members, but ended up eliminating all of them. When they learned of a 30-year-old man who lived in the same building as Christine, who people thought was suspicious, they questioned him. He openly admitted to having sex with Christine and a number of other children in the area. With this information, authorities believed they found their murderer and stopped looking for other suspects. The investigation died down as they continued looking for evidence to prove the man had murdered Christine. After returning from Hawaii, Clifford was off the streets for a few months after a 17-year-old girl went to the police and claimed he had raped her. Clifford claimed that it was consensual and she was only saying it was rape so her boyfriend wouldn't get upset about it. He was held without bail until the beginning of April when his lawyer got the charges dropped. When Clifford got out of jail, he went looking for the girl to get revenge but was unsuccessful. This close call must have sparked the idea that his rape victims needed to die, because after that he went on a rape and murder rampage that would leave a trail of ten more bodies. On April 10th, Joan gave birth to a boy named Stephen. Five days later, after visiting her and his son in the hospital, Clifford picked up 13-year-old Colleen Dagno. He saw her at a service station and couldn't pass up the opportunity. He pulled up and gave her his regular spiel about hiring young girls to wash windows for $10 an hour, and Colleen was immediately interested. She got in the car and Clifford gave her beer to get her drunk and offered her sleeping pills, claiming they were anti-drunk pills to knock her out. He drove to a secluded area where he raped her both vaginally and anally. He drove back to town and parked in a wooded area where he fell asleep in the car. The next morning, he woke Colleen and asked her if she remembered anything. She said she didn't, so for some reason, he raped her again. Then he took her into the woods and beat her to death with a hammer. Once she was dead, he stripped off her clothes and covered her body with branches. He threw her shoes into the woods and then buried her clothes. From there, he drove straight to the hospital and picked up Joan and the baby to bring them home. This time, it took six days before anyone filed a missing persons report. Colleen's grandmother told the police that she thought the girl was at a friend's house. The same day that Colleen was reported missing, 16-year-old Darren Johnstrude was in Vancouver to spend his spring break with his mother. He had left her house and walked down to the corner store where he was approached by Clifford with an offer to make some money. Darren couldn't pass it up and got into the car. Clifford offered to take him to a job site and introduce him to the other kids that worked for him, and on the way, he loaded Darren up with beer and sleeping pills. He parked in a wooded area, where he raped the boy before walking him into the woods and beating him on the head with the hammer. He laid the body over a stump and sodomized him again. Then, he just left him there. He made no effort to hide the body this time. He threw Darren's clothes and the hammer into the river and went to a car wash to clean out his car. Darren had left his house at 11.30 that morning and was expected back within a half an hour. After a few hours, his mother assumed that he had gotten lost and went out looking for him. When they couldn't find him by 6 p.m., they reported him missing. 
When officers arrived, they started taking a report, but when they learned that he was 16 years old, they stopped and said he was a runaway. They refused to continue the report and left. Darren's body was found by members of a retriever dog club on May 2nd. He was laying face down over the stump, exactly where Clifford had left him. He wasn't positively identified for five days, and then his stepfather became the prime suspect. Investigators dug into Darren's background and didn't find anything that would lead them to believe his stepfather would murder him. With the evidence of anal rape, they felt the boy may have been the victim of a child predator. Eventually, the case grew cold and was put on the back burner. On May 15th, Clifford and Joan got married. Four days later, he picked up 16-year-old Sandra Wolfsteiner, who was hitchhiking. She had no hesitation accepting a ride and hopped into the car. As Clifford chatted with her, fishing for information he could use, she revealed that she was unemployed. Clifford told her he could give her a job. After that, he fed her beer and got her good and drunk as he drove to a secluded area. He claimed that they were going to a cabin to pick up tools and had her walk into the woods. There, he hit her over the head with the hammer. While she was still barely alive, Clifford stripped off her clothes and raped her multiple times. He covered her body with branches and left her, claiming that she was still barely breathing when he did. He threw her clothes and purse out of the window as he drove back to town. He stopped at a creek and threw the hammer in the water. Sandra was headed to meet her boyfriend for lunch, and when she didn't arrive, he called her mother who said she had left that morning. When he called the police, they told him that they didn't take missing persons reports until the person had been missing for at least 48 hours. Then they told him that, if something bad had happened to her, he would most likely be their prime suspect. He offered to take a polygraph test, which he passed. Eventually, she was put on the missing persons list, but authorities didn't really seem concerned. Fortunately, this idea that you have to wait 24 or 48 hours to report someone missing is starting to go away. There is not now, nor has there ever been, any official rule that you have to wait any period of time before reporting someone missing. The sooner you start looking for a missing person, the better, so any rule like that would be completely counterintuitive to finding a missing person. In the past, this misconception was far more common, ironically mostly promoted by law enforcement officers themselves. If you want to report someone missing and are ever told you need to wait, you need to refuse that and ask to speak to a missing person's detective. Refuse to get off the phone or leave the station until they take you seriously. Over the next month, Clifford drugged and raped two young women who he let go. The first one reported him to the police, but she was considered to be slow and not a good witness. With no other evidence, the case was dropped. The second woman had been raped previously, and the rapist got a two-year suspended sentence, so she didn't bother reporting Clifford. She didn't see the use in going through all the trouble. Nice job, justice system. On June 21st, Clifford saw 13-year-old Ada Court walking down the street. She was coincidentally walking from babysitting in the same apartment complex where he lived to catch a bus back home. When he launched into his job offer, she turned him down since she wasn't local. She was just in the area babysitting for her brother. When Clifford asked her where she was going, she told him, and wouldn't you know it, that was exactly where Clifford was going, so he offered her a ride. She was tired and in a hurry to get home, so she accepted. As they drove, Clifford fed Ada beer and pills until she was passed out in the back seat. When they got to a secluded area near an old mining shaft, he managed to get her to walk with him into the woods. He hit her with a hammer and raped her multiple times before covering her with branches. When he got back to his car, he found it was hung up on a rock and he couldn't get it free. Frustrated, he went back to Ada's body where he sodomized her before re-covering her with the branches. Then he walked down a trail where he found some campers. He paid them $20 to use their truck to pull his car free. As he drove home, he tossed her clothes, other belongings, and the hammer. Ada was also reported missing relatively quickly and the police couldn't find any reason she would have run away. Her home life was more stable than the other youths who had fallen victim to Clifford Olson. They found no evidence of foul play and her family and boyfriend were cleared as suspects. 
she just went on the mounting pile of missing miners that kept popping up around the Vancouver area. When nine-year-old Simon Partington went missing from the same area on July 2nd, authorities finally started to notice a pattern. Clifford had been doing a real job on July 2nd, retiling a bathroom, and he left his helper at the job site to pick up lunch. As he was on his way to a burger joint, he saw Simon riding his bicycle and stopped to offer him a job. After the boy got into his car, he gave him beer and sleeping pills until he was unconscious. Clifford took him to a field and raped him, then used his own belt to strangle him. He also stabbed him in the back. He dragged Simon's body into some bushes and threw his clothes into the river. Authorities immediately took Simon's disappearance seriously due to his age and the fact that there were no issues at home that would cause him to run away. The news picked up the story of the missing nine-year-old and connected it with other missing children in the area. Now, parents knew that there was someone on the loose harming their children. Police didn't have any suspects until one detective pulled out a file on Clifford Olson. The day after Simon went missing, Clifford picked up a 16-year-old girl named Sarah and enticed her with a high-paying job. When he tried to get her to have sex with him, she turned him down, but he persisted. Eventually, she was able to get him to stop and he dropped her off, but he turned around and accused her of stealing money from him. In return, she reported him for sexual assault and the report had come across the detective's desk. When the detective looked into him, he found a record of rape charges from multiple underaged accusers. There were even a few parents who suspected Clifford had molested their infants, but all of the cases were either dropped or stalled due to lack of evidence. Then it was discovered that Clifford had lived near Ada Court, Darren Johnstrude, and Christine Weller at the time of their disappearances. The detective brought Clifford in for questioning, but didn't have any reason to hold him. There was no proof that Clifford was involved in any of the murders, but he was finally on someone's radar. This didn't seem to put a damper on Clifford's murder spree, since four days later, he picked up 14-year-old Judy Cosma, who he saw on the street. This young woman had already met Clifford, though. Two weeks earlier, he had pulled over and talked to her about a job, but she wouldn't get into his car. She said she had to talk to her parents first, so he offered to pick her up there the following day at the same spot. He wrote her name down in his notebook and took off, but the next day, he never showed up. He didn't remember her at all when he pulled up next to her this time, but after being reminded, he apologized and told her to hop in. She didn't hesitate this time. Clifford wasn't alone, though. He had a friend, a 19-year-old named Randy, with him, and all three of them started drinking beers and driving around. Eventually, Clifford dropped Randy off at a mall and continued to feed Judy alcohol and sleeping pills. By the time they reached the same secluded area where he had killed Ada, Judy was unconscious. As he got in the back seat with her, she began to wake up, so he punched her repeatedly until she was unconscious again. Then he raped her multiple times. When he was finished, he dragged her out of the car and tossed her down an embankment. He climbed down the hill and stabbed her 19 times. Then he drove down to a picnic area and burned Judy's clothes. The next morning, Clifford, Joan, and their son drove south to California for a vacation. Despite authorities having realized that the missing children in the area were possibly connected, they still shrugged off Judy Cosma's disappearance as her being a runaway. The Olsons spent some time in California and then returned to Vancouver on July 22nd. After being away, Clifford's need for violent sex and murder was in overdrive. He picked up 15-year-old Raymond King on July 23rd and offered him a job at $10 an hour. After booze and sleeping pills, he drove out to where he had murdered Judy and raped Raymond. Then he dragged the boy out of the car and laid him on a blanket on the ground. He took a hammer and a few nails out of the trunk and brought them to where Raymond was laying. Using a hammer, he drove a nail into the top of the boy's head. Raymond didn't die, but he was not responding to Clifford. Clifford sodomized the boy again before rolling him into a ravine. From the top of the ravine, Clifford threw large rocks down on Raymond, hitting him multiple times in the chest and the head. Satisfied that the boy was dead, Clifford then started throwing branches and dirt down the hill until the body was slightly covered. Clifford burned Raymond's clothes at the same spot he had burned Judy's clothes. 
The next day, four hikers found a body behind a log in a ravine. They ran down the hill to a construction site and called the police. An autopsy would reveal that the body belonged to Judy Cosma, who the police had assumed was a runaway. She had been raped and stabbed to death. They could find no link between Judy and Clifford or any of the other victims. On the same day, Clifford was already out hunting for another victim. 18-year-old Sigrun Arndt was visiting British Columbia from Germany and had separated from her traveling group to visit her cousin. When she found that her cousin wasn't home, she decided to take a bus back to where she was staying when she was approached by Clifford. Of course, his employment offer wouldn't work on the girl since she was just on vacation, but after talking to her, he offered her a ride and she accepted. He drugged her and took her out to a secluded area where he raped her and beat her on the head with a hammer. Then he pushed her body into a ditch filled with water. She was never reported missing. The group she was traveling with assumed that she had gone off on her own and didn't really worry about it. Her body would remain in the ditch for the next seven weeks. Clifford made it three more days before claiming another victim. On July 27th, he picked up 15-year-old Terry Carson with the offer of a high-paying job. He got her drunk and fed her sleeping pills and when she was unconscious, he took her to the mountains where he raped and killed her. He used a hammer to drive a six-inch screwdriver into her head while he sodomized her. Then he dragged her to a ditch and stood on her back, drowning her in three inches of water. While Clifford was in the mountains, raping and murdering Terry, an RCMP surveillance team was getting set up around his apartment. They watched him come home and he stayed there for the rest of the night. The following morning, Terry's mother reported her missing. Again, the police brushed it off as a runaway and told the worried mother to wait it out. They were sure that her daughter would turn up soon. While they were telling her this, her daughter was lying dead in a ditch in the mountains. Unfortunately, the surveillance teams didn't always have their eyes on Clifford. He was so naturally erratic that there were times when they thought he was on to them so they backed off. Other times, the surveillance was called off simply due to overtime costs. One of those times was July 30th, when Clifford would pick up his final victim. 17-year-old Louise Chartrand was hanging out in town when Clifford approached her with an offer to shampoo carpets for $10 an hour. She got in the car and was soon passed out from booze and sleeping pills. He drove her out to Whistler, where he raped her multiple times and then killed her with a blow to the back of the head with a hammer. She fell into a depression in the ground and Clifford covered her body with sand. He drove a ways where he buried her clothes and then threw the hammer into the bushes. When he was finished, he drove straight home, picked up Joan and his son, and drove to Alberta. When Louise was reported missing, the police were afraid that Clifford had struck again while they weren't watching him. Surveillance teams went back to his house, but they realized that he was gone. On August 5th, a hiker stumbled onto the body of Raymond King. When the autopsy revealed the presence of a three-inch nail embedded in his skull, authorities knew they had to get the suspect off of the streets. After realizing that Raymond's body was found not far from where Judy's body had been found, detectives searched the area for other bodies but didn't find anything. Clifford returned to Vancouver the day after Raymond's body was found, and by the 7th, he was under 24-hour surveillance. No breaks. The surveillance team followed him everywhere he went and witnessed everything he did. They saw him break into people's residences and steal their belongings. They saw him steal merchandise from stores. They made notes of all of his petty crimes, but they were there to get him for multiple murders, so they didn't stop him from stealing. On August 12th, he took a ferry to Vancouver Island and picked up a couple of young girls who were hitchhiking. When he pulled over in a wooded area, the police couldn't risk him murdering the girls, so they moved in and arrested him. They initially charged him with two counts of breaking and entering for some of the petty crimes they had witnessed. When they searched his belongings, they flipped through his little notebook and stopped on the page where he had written down Judy Cosma's name. He had forgotten that he had written her name in his notebook two weeks before he had killed her. Now, authorities had a link to at least one of the victims. When police arrested him, the girls in his car hadn't been harmed and weren't even that intoxicated. 
Clifford professed his innocence, but in a later interview he admitted that he had planned to rape and kill them. He said that he had no idea that he was under surveillance. When he was interrogated, he denied any involvement in missing and murdered children, even Judy. They asked why her name was in his notebook and he just shrugged it off. Having someone's name written down doesn't mean you killed them. Investigators eventually talked to Randy, who confirmed that Clifford had picked up Judy. That was enough to charge Clifford with her murder, but they weren't sure if it was enough to convict him. Without any hard evidence against Clifford, they just relentlessly interrogated him until he broke under the pressure. Clifford started suggesting he would confess if they guaranteed that he would go to a mental institution. He began talking about having a split personality and then claiming that booze and pills made him do it. Clifford was told that they couldn't guarantee that he would be sent to a psychiatric facility. Only the judge and a psychiatrist could order that. Then Clifford told the detective that he would give him 11 bodies for $100,000. They eventually wrote out a deal that the RCMP would pay Joan $10,000 after he showed them the location of one body for a total of seven bodies. Then they would pay Joan the final $30,000 after he revealed the locations of the four remaining bodies. Despite the idea of paying money for bodies being horrifying to many people involved, the RCMP agreed and on August 24, 1981, Clifford Olson began showing the authorities the locations of 11 victims. They were Christine Weller, Colleen Dagno, Darren Johnstrude, Sandra Wolfsteiner, Ada Court, Simon Partington, Judy Cosma, Raymond King, Sigrun Arnd, Terry Carson, and Louise Chartrand. Even though he directed the police to every body, he pleaded not guilty to all counts. On the first day of the trial, Clifford changed his mind and pleaded guilty. For drugging, raping, and then murdering 11 children by either strangulation, stabbing, or bludgeoning them to death, Clifford Olson received a life sentence with a chance of parole after 25 years on all counts, to be served concurrently. So he essentially got one sentence and would be eligible for parole after 25 years. Now, being eligible for parole does not guarantee that he would get it, and many criminals spend the rest of their lives in prison in Canada. But even offering the chance of parole after 25 years seems like a slap in the face to the victims and their families. Spending 25 years in prison will never change someone like Clifford Olson. In maximum security prison, Clifford's cell had to be retrofitted with a layer of plexiglass because other inmates would throw cups of urine at him or shoot pins at him through homemade dart guns. Even though he was in protective custody with the worst of the worst, he was still a child rapist and murderer and that made him a target. Clifford attempted to make another deal, claiming responsibility for 10 more murdered youths in Canada and 27 in the United States. Eventually, Clifford made another deal to exchange the location of more bodies for a trip to BC to visit Joan and Stephen. While there, Clifford only gave the police the runaround and after he returned to prison, they stopped making deals with him. He continued to write to the Prime Minister and various US governors, but nobody took him seriously. Clifford Olson died in prison on October 2, 2011. In his 71 years alive, he spent about 50 of them behind bars. He only spent about four years of his adult life outside of prison. In those four years, it's estimated that he committed close to 10,000 property crimes, 1,200 sexual assaults, and around 50 murders. Clifford Olson simply had no empathy. He had no ability to understand other people's emotions. He could hurt people financially, emotionally, and physically without a second thought. He didn't feel anything about his victims or how their families felt. He was a true psychopathic monster. If you're the victim of domestic abuse, please reach out to someone for help. Talk to your local shelter or call the National Domestic Abuse Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE. That's 1-800-799-7233. Or you can go to thehotline.org to chat with someone online. This website is set up so that at any time, hitting the escape key twice will take you to a Google search page. That way, if your abuser is nearby, you won't get caught seeking help. 
If you're having feelings of harming yourself or someone else, or even just need someone to talk to, please contact your local mental health facility, call 911, or call Mental Health America, who operate the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-TALK. That's 1-800-273-8255. They're available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Thanks so much for letting me tell you this story. If you enjoyed it, subscribe on whatever platform you're on, hit like, rate us, or leave us a comment. You can also check out our other show, Somewhere Sinister, on YouTube or anywhere you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to support the show, check out our new merch at Teespring. The link is in the description. Thanks again, and be safe.